Hello again, I'm Paul Beckwith and this is Shackleton and we're talking about the catastrophic uh, Hurricane Dorian that has just pretty much destroyed the Grand Bahama Islands and the islands in the Bahamas just to the east of the Grand Bahamas. So this is Shackleton as you know, he's been helping me out with all of my videos. So let's get right to the um, continue, continue where we left off in the previous video. This guy wants to get down. Okay, so this is the Grand Bahama Islands, and these are the Abaco Islands here. So the hurricane came across here, and it basically parked in an unprecedented fashion. We had a Category 5 hurricane actually park and move extremely slowly across this whole region. It could not be, there could not be a worse situation for, for the Grand Bahamas. Perhaps the only thing worse would have if, be, if the hurricane had been a slightly lower path and, and, and hit directly onto Freeport, which is the second largest city in the Bahamas. So I was talking, I ended up the last video talking about how the, the wind speeds of Dorian reached um, sustained winds of over 180, 185 miles per hour. Um, and basically those type of wind speeds, you know, approaching and exceeding 300 kilometers an hour should be in a category six. There, there, there needs to be a category six because the, the, the storms are so strong now that this scale is, uh, needs to be updated. And I think I, I argued this the, f the first time, like five years ago or something, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, we have utterly catastrophic damage to buildings, everything, you know, the winds destroying the buildings and the storm surge being up to 20, 24, 25 feet, you know, just inundating, you know, most of the, uh, most of those particular, those islands. So let's have a look on Earth Null School at what we actually uh, have with, with this hurricane. So I'm looking at now air, surface, winds, okay, and basically this is the storm that we have here, okay, still pegged, just uh, you can see this is uh, Grand Bahama Island, and it's just starting to move north of the island, and we can go back, um, if we go back a day at a time, you can see it was on the island and then it was approaching. Okay, and you can, I'll just go back to where we can see the thing forming. Okay, so you can see it. Okay, you can't see much here on, on August 22nd, but August 23rd, we're basically this region, this disturbance here is the origins of this hurricane. Then a day later, it's starting to get more formed here. Okay, and move across. Okay, you can track it on its path. And it's still fairly weak here. And then it hit a lot, much, much warmer water and it started to intensify. Okay, and then it came up here. It looked like it was gonna swing right up here, but it switched path, you know, and came more to the west and came right over the um, Bahamas where, where then it pegged, it stalled out and it, it, it just sort of sat there. And this is a projection, you know, of how it will, it's expected to come in the days, in the days ahead. Now, if we look at the waves um, that have been formed from this storm, you can go um, ocean waves and uh, you know, we're looking at the, uh, if we just click here, you can see not eight, almost nine meters, 8.95 meters. Okay, you can see the wave height of this storm. And if we back up in time, um, a day at a time, you can see the progression. So you can actually follow the track of the storm just by the uh, wave height disturbance. So there we go, we started down here. You know, we can, we can see if we can go back and see it any further. You know, maybe here. You know, and here, yeah, you can see the origins all the way back, eh? Let's keep going. Up here now. 
Okay, there's something here, there's something here, probably this one. You know, you can do, uh, and then something here. Okay, so you can look at that. You can track it th that way using Earth Null School. If we look at the sea surface temperature, uh, 28 degrees here, you know, now. Okay, 27.9 degrees. And, uh, you know, we can go back. Okay, and you can see the uh, water temperatures here. So anything above about 26 and a half is going to add fuel and energy to a hurricane. Okay, so basically, but what's interesting here is the sea surface temperature anomaly, the area around the Bahamas here was actually not even, the sea surface temperature was colder than normal by about a degree or so. Okay, half a degree, 0.6 up in this region. It was actually cooler. You know, we can go back, uh, you know, this is the 22nd of August. This is August 17th. It doesn't update every day. It doesn't have data for every day. But you can see it's, you know, it's about a degree cooler than normal in that region. Although it's still well over 26 and a half. So still enough to give, you know, tremendous amounts of energy to the, to the storm. And the big, the key thing is why did the storm stall out? Um, we know that in a warming world, as the jet streams, as the Arctic warms like crazy, and the jet streams slow down and get wavier, there, um, then, then storms are being transported more slowly. So the steering currents for a lot of these hurricanes is slowing down because the temperature is warmer in the ocean, there's more evaporation, more water vapor, you know. 7% um, more water vapor can be held in the air for every uh, degree Celsius, which is one, every 1 1.8 Fahrenheit increase in temperature. And that's fueling these storms to be of greater strength. And we're getting more category fours and fives at the expense of fewer category ones and twos, as I'll explain when I go over that paper in detail on climate change impacts. Also, the intensification of storms is happening more quickly. And the pressure uh, at the eye, the, the, the lowest pressure at the center of the hurricane is, is increasing, which is, which is an indication of the strength of the hurricane increasing. The storms are moving slower. They're moving to higher and higher latitudes. Um, and they're um, dumping far more rain. Um, but, let's, but in terms of the steering currents, we know that Harvey stalled over uh, Texas in 2017. It moved about one or two miles an hour. It was half on the ocean, half on the land. So it maintained its strength for long periods of time, dumping up to five feet of rainfall in some parts of Texas, causing huge um, financial costs and hardship to people there. So, but this is a storm, but that's stalling on, on land um, or moving very slowly on land. This is stalling, you know, over an island, right? I mean, this is, uh, this is uh, basically, go now, this is st stalling out at sea over a small island. Um, and we haven't seen this before. Okay, this is a completely um, new phenomena. Okay, so why did it stall out? So let's have a look. So what I'm doing is I'm looking at the steering winds, the upper level winds. I'm, I've got it on air, 250 millibar, the height of the jet streams, wind. Okay, and now, this is what we have now. So what you can see is, we'll go back uh, several days and you can see exactly what's happening. So this is uh, back one day, back two days, back three days. Okay, so the, here you can see the storm coming in. Okay, so it's moving in. You can see it right here. And again, this is up at the jet stream level. So you, what you're seeing is, you know, if we go back down um, halfway through the atmosphere, 700, you know, closer to the surface, closer to the surface, that's about one and, a kilometer, one and a half kilometers high. And near the surface, you can see the strength of the winds. But we're looking up 
at the jet stream levels, and you can see how the storm extends all the way up. Um, and uh, what you can see is, so as we, um, yeah, so as we move forward in time, you can see the storm's forward motion slows down, and it basically gets pegged and stays at this region. So what's happening is, is some of the winds from the jet stream here, so this is a sort of like a trough of the jet stream. Some of the winds are coming down and they're pushing against the hurricane. We've got the, um, there's a low pressure area. So air is coming in, rotates to the right, uh, deflects to the right because of the Coriolis force. And it causes that rotation of the hurricane here. But we're being, we're meeting up against these winds forcing it down. So the forces around the hurricane completely balanced out, allowing this particular storm to just stabilize, have zero forward velocity for a, basically essentially a day and a half almost. It hardly moved at all for, for a day and a half because these forces balanced. And as we go forward in time, what you can see is that the, the, this trough is actually move, starts moving down a bit Okay, it's starting to move down. Okay, do you see this? It's starting to move down and then it will come up and it will basically start the storm moving again. Okay, so you can see the motion here now. So it's gonna, it starts the storm, you know, it, it unpins it from the Bahamas and it starts to move it. The steering currents start to move it. And if we look at where we are now, you can see this definite trough here. Okay, so this trough actually will get this storm moving again and bring it up and to continue on its path. But the configuration of the jet stream, um, with the trough being much, much farther north of where the hurricane was, but some winds coming down enough to just give it that little bit of a push to stop its forward motion, is basically what happens. So it's just the confluence of of, of uh, these, these events transpired to st park this thing over the Grand Cayman, which has been totally devastated as a result. Now, it does lead to the question is, you know, what do we do moving forward? You know, what's probably gonna happen is it will just be rebuilt. People are always talking about just rebuilding and rebuilding and rebuilding. But we really do have to think about areas of the planet that um, really need to become uh, you know, if they're going to be subject to repeated disasters, there comes a point where we don't have money to, to rebuild and the infrastructure won't be rebuilt and these places will just be left alone and abandoned and will be basically uninhabitable. So talking about parts uh, mostly near the equator, you know, where the temperature humidity combination gets too high above 35 degrees Celsius, 100% humidity, you can't be outside, you know, these areas basically, you know, parts of the planet are going to become uninhabitable as climate change proceeds. And the question is, is when do you pull the plug on a location? Because human nature is we just want to rebuild and continue going as normal, but we cannot do that. We can't afford to do that. You know, the climate is not allowing us to do that. Okay, so Let's get now to more of the science of how climate change is making hurricanes more dangerous. Okay, we have stronger wind speeds, more rain, worse storm, bigger storm surges, adding up to more potential destruction. Okay, so this is a very good article. Okay, major hurricanes are the world's costliest natural weather disasters, in some cases causing well over 100 billion in damage. Think of Katrina. Think of Sandy. Now there's evidence that the unnatural effects of human-caused global warming are already making hurricanes stronger and more destructive. Okay, so let's talk about some of the research. So generally, the hurricanes form, you know, we call them hurricanes in the Atlantic Ocean. They're called typhoons in the Western Pacific, just cyclones in the Indian Ocean. And cyclone is the typical, you know, it's, it's, it's the... The, 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 it's a name for all of these devices. A cyclone is a low pressure area and the winds will then circle around that area. Um, if it's low pressure, they'll circle counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere and clockwise in the southern hemisphere. So I'll continue this in a third video. Thank you for listening.